Dear family, in the blood of Christ that has made you a heir of a righteous inheritance. I'll reread one verse from our first lesson from Ruth. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. And later on, the women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman. This is the word of our God. In 2000, my family and I moved to Sweden. I was 12 years old. My dad was called to serve as a missionary there for two different cities, making up one congregation of about 30 people. You know, I think 30 is pretty small, but this is pretty normal in our church in Sweden. Churches lay empty, and a few remain as a family of believers. But as we prepared to move there, my four siblings and I were very excited. This was the land of legend where my mother was from. There was all this unknown, this wondering what it would be like, this great and foreign country. And you know, as a kid, you just build up these things as a huge fantasy, an exciting, exciting thing to look forward to. And it was exciting. As we prepared to go, we packed up our things, got on the airplane, missed our connection flight, ended up sleeping as a family in the airport, and got redirected through Canada and Iceland, and finally to Sweden. And when we arrived, we got out of the plane, and the air smelled different. The people were quiet. They weren't ready to say hi, or how are you, or how you been, or hey. And there are none of it. Swedish people are very quiet, and the roads are small. And the buildings are bright. And all these other things made us realize as kids that this wasn't going to be the adventure that we had imagined before we left. And that first summer was really hard. First off, because it rained every single day. And that's what we thought it was going to be like the whole time we were there. Next summer, it was sunny the whole summer. So it didn't necessarily make sense. But on top of that, everything was different. Nothing felt familiar. We couldn't speak the language at first. We were very uncomfortable. But what made it okay, what made us comfortable, even though we lived in this tiny three-bedroom apartment to fit all seven of us, we were okay because we had one We had family. We had those we were closest to. And even if the whole world around us was weird and foreign and different and scary, we were safe, felt safe and secure because of our family. And not just my brothers and sisters, but also that family of believers. Those 30 people that my dad served were our family. And they cared for us with the same love that I knew from back in the States. It was familiar. It was caring. Even if we knocked over the altar, even if we knocked over the cross, they were kind to us and forgave us and took care of us. I can relate with Ruth. She left everything. She left her country, her home, her people, her people's conception of who God was to stay with her family, her mother. She was the one she was with now and would stay with her. And so I understand why Ruth did what she did, too. Can you relate with Ruth? Now, I don't necessarily mean that you've moved to a foreign country. And many of you have, but some of you have lived here your whole lives. That's not just what I mean, but her feeling of being in a new place, with different surroundings, where most things aren't comfortable, 
It could be a simple thing of moving to a new house, to a new neighborhood. You don't know the neighbors around you. It could have been from going grade, going from grade school to high school where you left your old friends and now you started and you have to meet all these new people and everything is very scary. No matter what the situation, we've all kind of felt like Ruth did. Out of place. And a foreigner. If anything, for being a Christian. Jesus tells us that we are all foreigners and strangers in this world. Because we've been called out of it. We've become part of a different family. And so when the world sees us, a lot of times we will be treated as foreigners and strangers. But what helps? Well, what helped Ruth? What helped me in Sweden? And what helps you? Is that you have a family. Yes, your wonderful family around you those in your immediate nucleus of a family, but also this family. When we come here, we are bound together as blood because of Christ. Each of us has been made a child of God through the blood of Christ, which has made us brothers and sisters with each other. So I ask, do you feel like this body is your family? Those who you would leave everything else to help, to love, to care for. Ruth's story is a beautiful, beautiful thing. We watch her leave everything to go to be with the new people that will hopefully be her new family. These were the people of Israel who knew God, the same God that Naomi had taught Ruth about, this God of love and inspired her to care so much that she would give up her foreign gods and cling to this God who was the Savior God who had saved them from slavery and all these things and had promised the Savior. Ruth clung to that. And she hoped that those she met when she got to Israel would be kind to her too. But in fear she goes out and into a stranger's field to collect some of the grain that they leave behind after the harvesters go through. They had a law in Israel that they couldn't go back and pick up the strays that they had missed. They had to leave those for people like widows and poor people so that they had some food left over. So she's going behind the harvesters gathering this, but she doesn't really understand the customs. And she starts to grab a little bit from what they've already gathered, which is against the law, and she could get in trouble. So everyone knew that she was a foreigner. Plus, this was a small town, small town of Bethlehem. Everyone knew that she was a new, a new girl in town. Kind of reminds me of coming to Glenville. This small town where I moved here, and everyone knows I didn't grow up with their kids. They don't know my parents. They don't know the background. Many of you have moved here. The nature of a small town, and just like Ruth, I can tell people know that. Well, while Ruth is feeling somewhat out of place, the master of the field comes to talk to her, Boaz. And he asks her if she's okay, because there she is, not sure about herself. She was sitting away, kind of feeling dejected. And he comes up to her and tells her that he knows about her. He's talked to Naomi about her. And he knows that she left everything to be with her mother-in-law. And he commends her for that. And he shows her this immense love, saying, stay in this field. I will protect you. Actually, in secret, he makes sure that his harvesters leave a little bit more of the grain behind so that she has that. He invites her to have a meal with the workers, to drink from their water. He takes care of her. Why? Because he's family. Not just a blood relative, which they find out later that he is, but just because... He is filled with God's love. When she returns back to her mother-in-law, she gets really excited because she finds out that Boaz is actually a blood relative. And so he could fulfill the duty of the kinsman redeemer. Now what is this kinsman redeemer that our text talks about? The kinsman redeemer was a law that was established by Moses on Mount Sinai given from God. 
It was a law that helped protect families. All of Israel was organized in family units and clans. That's why they had the 12 tribes of Judah. And inside of those clans, there were these laws to help them take care of one another. One of those laws was the cancer of the dealer. So how it works was, if someone's brother, so if I'm here and I have a brother, and he would have a wife, then he dies. So he's not able to <coughs> produce an heir, someone to continue their line and their property and take care of everything. Then it was my job to make sure she was taken care of. So I would buy that property because it had to be available on the property. I'll buy the property, I'll make sure she was taken care of, and if in the right situation, I would marry that woman and she would become my wife and I would take care of her. But my first child would count as my dead brother's son. So essentially, you're giving up that first son for her. That's what the kinsman redeemer was. So when Naomi is talking about this, she realized this is a huge thing. And sadly, it didn't always happen. It was a beautiful law God gave, but it didn't always happen that way. So when Ruth came back and proposed this, Naomi and Ruth didn't know how he was going to react. Plus, since it was Ruth that was this way, it was already one step removed. So Boaz didn't have to follow this law. But he did anyway. And he did more than that. He bought the field to protect Naomi and Ruth. He married her. And yes, he committed to give his son as her successor. He showed all his love, not because he had to, but because he wanted to. This is a story of love that comes from God. Love that people show one another as not just blood relatives, but as a family in Christ. And I'm sure that you can think of moments when your family and your extended family, your brothers and sisters in the faith, have shown you love kind of like this. It is such a beautiful thing when family loves one another. It doesn't always happen, but when it does, it's beautiful. Just think about your family. Think about some mistake you made, how you've driven your brothers and sisters crazy, how you have weaknesses that they know full well about, and yet they continue to choose to love you. When they do, they show a beautiful love that is out of this world. And when we, as a family of believers, show love to one another like that, what do we show? We show Christ's love for us. We show a love that doesn't come from this world, that you can't go to the supermarket and find. It's something that comes from God, this love that cares, even if it doesn't have any gain for ourselves. And that's rare, that kind of love. You don't find it out there, and sadly, sometimes you don't find it among believers either question that comes to my mind when it doesn't show up is what are others seeing from us when we don't love as if we have been loved by Jesus. We definitely don't give off the feeling that we are a family. And that's sad because then someone who sees that will leave and think there's nothing here for them that they can't find somewhere else. But there is. There is. And so when we forget to love as Jesus loved, let us be reminded by our kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ. Just like Boaz gave up so much for Ruth, he self-sacrificed all of this. Jesus was in a line of his own. He was the one man who was part of God's family. Everyone else, because of their sin, were separated from him. And yet God chose to marry his church, those who believed in him. Not because we deserved it, not because we had anything to bring, just like Ruth. She didn't have anything. She was a foreigner. And yet Boaz chose to marry her. And God chose to 
to marry us as his church. To make us a part of God's family. He came and he paid the debt that we needed paid. And not only that, he didn't just wipe our slate, but he gave us his inheritance. He called us sons and daughters of God. In order to do that, he gave us his blood so that we would become connected with God through that very blood of God himself. He made us righteous. He gave us the inheritance of his life and his home. This is the law that binds up the brokenhearted, the outsider, the loner. This is the law that has found you and fixed you from wherever background you are from. All of us here come from very different places. We're different types of people. Yeah. And somewhere else, I don't know if I'd find all these different people together in one place. So why are we here? Because we are all united in this, and we need a Savior. A kinsman redeemer who paid for us to be new. We need a family. A family not just at home, but a family for right now and for eternity. We need a family that cares about us and loves us no matter what. And that's what God gives us. He's made us sons and daughters of God. So that no matter where we are, no matter how much of a foreigner we feel like in the different circumstances of our life, we know that we have a family, a home, a safe place to go, someone who knows who we are and yet still loves us. So when we think about one another here, let's look at each other that way. Each one of you has been bought by Christ. Loved by Him. He thinks that much of each and every one of you. That's why He called you here. And we have the immense privilege to not just have our close family, which is wonderful, but we have this great family around us so that we can care for each other, encourage one another, tell each other when we're wrong, discipline one another out of love. Be there in the hard times and the good times you have one another as family, so that when everything else is falling away, when trouble and hardship come, you have a wonderful family that are bound together by the love of Christ, the great Redeemer. Let us share that love, not only with one another, but with others. When others come to us and need help, or when we see that they need help, let us share this kind of selfless love that they can't find anywhere else. But you have, because of Jesus. It's a free gift. Gifts are meant to be shared. So this Christmas, give a wonderful gift to those around you here in this congregation. Love them. And when others who are hurting need a family, be that family for them. Because they too have been paid for by the blood of Jesus. We have a wonderful task. Go and do that this Christmas season. Amen.